So I'm going to introduce our wonderful speakers tonight. Very welcome to Professor Keith Lilly and Dr. Francis Kane, and we are delighted you're here tonight to deliver this talk for Libraries NI as part of Heritage Week. Professor Keith Lilly is an historical geographer at Queen's University Belfast in the Department of Geography. His teachings and research focuses on maps and landscapes and straddles history, geography and archaeology. He has led community heritage projects exploring the landscapes legacies of the Ordnance Survey in Ireland and in Scotland. And Keith is currently collaborating on a digital research project along with Dr Kane and researchers across Ireland piecing together the archives of the Irish OS of 200 years ago. Dr Francis Kane is a lecturer in English linguistics with a research interest in the area of the Celtic language. Dr Kane has worked as a research fellow as part of the Northern Ireland Place Name Project, which has been gathering and analysing historical forms of place names from 1987. And as part of Libraries NI Heritage Week, along with another colleague, Dr Zenobi Garrett, has been delivering a place name workshop to school children, bringing the OS maps and the heritage of townlands to a new generation. Thank you. In this evening's talk, they will explore how the townlands were surveyed and mapped how their names were gathered and recorded by Ireland's Ordnance Survey. Drawing on exciting new research at Queen's University Belfast, these tales from the townlands tell us about those places in the distant past, as well as about life in the field for those involved in mapping out Ireland's 60,000 plus townlands. So it is with great pleasure I hand you over to Keith and Francis to enjoy tonight's talk. Sit back and enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> so. Hi, everybody. Thanks ever so much. Uh, so that's really kind of you. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, um, Eileen, as well, for the introduction. And thank you, everybody, for being here this evening. If you are on our time zone, if you're not on our time zone, whatever time of the day it is, you're very welcome. Um, so, yes, Francis and I are going to talk um, sort of half and half, really. So I'm going to say a few words to begin with um, for the first part of the talk. And then I'm going to hand over to Francis. And then there'll be an opportunity um, at the end to uh, answer any questions. If anybody has any questions or any points for discussion and so on, we'd be delighted to hear uh, your or see your questions and, and to hear your comments and so on. So what I'm going to do is, uh, or be, you don't want to see my face, you want to see the slides. Um, so I'm just going to try ooh, uh, and identify where we are on this. Here we go. And I need to press that one. And somebody maybe can just give me the old thumbs up that all is well. Is all well? Yes. Okay, good. So Tales, Tales from the Townlands uh, is what we have titled the talk uh, tonight. Uh, we're very grateful to Libraries NI for hosting us. We're delighted to be part of Heritage Week for 2024. I've been working uh, with Francis now on a project which we are drawing upon quite a lot this evening, um, the Ordnance Survey 200 project, OS 200, but also, uh, as been mentioned at the start, um, Francis's project, um, the Northern Ireland Place Names project, which he's involved with as well, very closely leading off on that with colleagues at Queen's uh, as well. So it is a, a very much a kind of joint effort uh, this evening. And as I said, we're going to be sort of doing a half and half uh, type arrangement. Um, I should just like to say at the very start as well, I'm very grateful to our funders, the Irish Research Council and the Arts and Humanities Research Council for funding this project OS 200, which we're going to say something about this evening. Um, so Tales from the Townlands, and so Tales really about the Townlands uh, recorded through their names, um, and also tales from the townlands, from the surveyors themselves, from the Ordnance Survey surveyors from 200 years ago, who were involved in um, creating a detailed survey of the island of Ireland at the large scale of six inches to one mile. So what we're going to be doing is tying together names, place names, townlands, and, uh, and maps this evening. And that's really the idea. And I'm going to really focus more on the mappy bit um, so just to sort of set the scene uh, a little bit with um, what we're focusing on here tonight. So we're looking at the Ordnance Survey um, and its activities 200 years ago, the bicentenary 200th anniversary 
of the uh, start of the operations of the Ordnance Survey on the island of Ireland. And, and the Ordnance Survey already had been in existence as a, as a mapping organization uh, within Great Britain. And uh, a few, 1991, a little quotation there from a, a bicentenary volume published at the time. So the Ordnance Survey was established in 1791. And the Ordnance Surveys in the plural, because there's one for Great Britain, one for uh, OSI for the, uh, the Ordnance Survey Ireland for the South, um, and, and OSNI, Ordnance Survey Northern Ireland for the North. The three Ordnance Surveys came together to produce the little sort of series of volumes in that uh, bicentenary year. And the quotation there reminds us of the origins, really, the purpose, the principal purpose, if you like, the stated purpose, perhaps we should say, the stated purpose of the Ordnance Survey in Ireland in the 1820s, as it says there, early in the 19th century, it became obvious that the local taxes in Ireland, which were called the county cess and based on townland units, were inequitable. And then the, finally, on the recommendations of the Spring Rice Committee, a survey of all Ireland at a scale of six inches to one mile was authorized by British Parliament. So we're very clearly stating the purpose, really, principal purpose was really around accurately calculating the areas of townlands. And townlands are very much at the heart of what we're talking about this evening, of course, and are the ways in which we connect Francis's interests around place names and naming landscapes, and my interests around the Ordnance Survey and its uh, maps, and particularly the survey practices associated with the making of maps under the Ordnance Survey in Ireland uh, 200 years ago. And the, the image there is actually, uh, many of you I'm sure will be familiar with the Public Rock Record Office of Northern Ireland historical maps viewer down there in the bottom part of the slide, you'll see the URL for that. And this is just a little extract, the digitized first edition six inch Ordnance Survey maps. And when we're talking about townlands, we're really talking about, see, see the little dotty lines running across the map there. This is for Benevena up on the North Coast of Northern Ireland. Um, so the little dotty lines there that you see on the map here are the townland boundaries and the um, italicized but quite large writing at the bottom of that map extract just below where it says Benevena are the townland names. Of course, when we talk about townlands and we talk about place names and we talk about the Orton Survey, we are entering into a quite an interesting territory, really, um, thinking about the naming of uh, places uh, and also how names appear on maps. And there's quite an interesting literature emerging among scholars, what we might call today decolonizing the map or thinking more critically about how, how maps are made, the silences on map. We recognize that maps are always selective. Uh, and always culturally embedded and reflect the cultures and values of those who are paid to produce them. Uh, in this case, the state, uh, the British state, uh, paying for the mapping of Ireland. So uh, Julian Doherty's book is there, The Irish Ordnance Survey. And of course, I'm sure many of us will be familiar with Brian Friel's translations there. The captain is the man who actually makes the new map, says uh, Friel. George's task is to see that the place names on the map are correct. And, you know, we open up the map, you know, it's a really interesting topic for exploration and for discussion. And one of the things we're trying to do through our OS 200 project, which the full title is up there, um, Digitally Remapping Islands Ordnance Survey Heritage. One of the things we're trying to do is reconnect the very disparate records of the early Ordnance Survey in time for the bicentenary, which will be really the Spring Rice Committee reported in 21st of June, 1824. So we are holding a conference and launching our uh, resource, our online web resource, based upon pulling together all these different various records of the Ordnance Survey. That includes the six inch maps, of course, which is what we're looking at here. It includes further north of Ireland, the OS memoirs. It includes letters, Donovan, Donovan's letters, and also selection of the Ordnance Survey name books. Um, so there'll be a, in June the launch of this particular resource and what we're trying to do here and what we're talking about tonight really actually some of the results of this research is to use um, the power of digital tools and digital technologies to explore hidden geographies of the Ordnance Survey and the roles of the surveyors in the making of maps so 200 years ago. So that's really what we're trying to 
uh, with that project. And that's what we're trying to draw upon. And we've got a range of materials which were from different locations, actually. And some of these are familiar to us. They're all in a digital format, but others are, although they might be familiar, like the memoirs, they're not currently in a digital format. So we've been working really hard. And uh, my colleagues on the project, especially Zenobi Garrett at the University of Limerick, her name's already been mentioned, who works very closely with Francis uh, and also Rebecca Milligan as well. Uh, a team of really hardworking researchers have been uh, trying to digitize, connect these different resources together. And we will see the end results in not too long now, actually just a few months time. Watch this space. Um, those different sources actually have different geographies. Um, the maps in our database cover the whole of the island. Um, the memoirs, the text of the memoirs, as many of you will be well aware, only really cover the northern counties before the money ran out. Um, but for the memoirs, there are drawings as well, which are associated with the memoirs. They have slightly larger, wider geography. The letters have an interesting geography as well. There tends to be a concentration you can see there in the middle part of the island. Uh, and for the name books, they do they do exist for the whole of the island of Ireland, but. Um, in our project, because they're very detailed and quite complex documents, we've decided really just to focus in on the name books relating to the to the border counties um, to explore some of those issues around naming the naming of places through the maps. So this evening, what you're going to be getting is a little bit more from me uh, about mapping and especially the maps, the Ordnance Survey maps, and thinking about the tales from the townlands that were being surveyed by the Ordnance Survey surveyors as they traverse their way around uh, the island of Ireland in the 1820s, 30s, and even into the 1840s. And then I'm going to hand over to uh, Francis, and Francis is going to take us through names on the map and uh, the tales from the townlands. So that's the plan for uh, this evening. So first of all, then, uh, a little bit about uh, mapping Ireland from me. And I mentioned already um, the, uh, the, the quotation there about the importance of townlands in the survey. And I've got another little quotation for you here, actually. This is from um, the instructions that were given to the Ordnance Survey surveyors by Thomas Colby. And Thomas Colby was the man in charge, really, for all of this. Um, so this is one of the instructions. This is instruction number 48 in a whole list of these instructions which were given to the surveyors, the surveying teams. But it speaks to this slide, and that's why I've chosen it. It says, so I'm quoting here now, the areas of baronies, parishes, etc., are required to be correctly ascertained, as well as those of townlands, uh, etc. So if you remember the point earlier on that I made about the importance in the survey of Ireland under the Ordnance Survey in calculating as accurately as possible the areas of townlands for reassessing that taxation, um, at the bottom of our sort of hierarchy here of administrative units, we have that town and the smallest of the units, um, 64,000, as you can see there, a huge number of townlands. But that sort of, sort of nested hierarchy, of the administrative system, is something we need to sort of think about as we look at our maps. Because the maps themselves, when you look at the details of the Ordnance Survey maps, they are full of information about boundaries. So we have the uh, from the top, the province, the county, the barony, the parish, and right at the bottom, the townlands of 64,000. And it's a townland that Francis are kind of working together on uh, for this particular tour. That's really our focus, the tales from the townlands. So the townlands themselves, the smallest official territorial division, um, the origins of the townlands, lost in the midst of time. Um, so the, uh, I suppose, wisdom is that they uh, go back at least a thousand years, but who knows, originally based on Ballybows, uh, as it says there. And when we actually start wandering around um, the place, and we often actually come across those townlands made visible to us in the names, like the, like the name you'd see there out in the countryside or even in towns as well, in the urban areas and rural areas. Um, so so they, are, they are very much sort of present in the living landscape of Ireland, north and south. They're still very much part of our um, uh, rich sort of landscape and, and identity, uh, the townlands themselves. They appear on the Ordnance Survey maps very boldly, really, uh, literally, in terms of the typography. And uh, I've got a little extract for you here just to illustrate that. This is actually from 
the north coast up near McGilligan uh, on Loch Foyle. And uh, you'll see there the title, the name of the town and uh, Ballymore Holland in this particular case. Um, and the type there says very, um, one of the, if you look at a Northern Survey six inch map, the first edition series from this period, then the names of the townlands are perhaps the most dominant of the writing on the maps. Again, it's showing you the importance, showing us the importance of these. There's your little dotty lines and the dotted lines represent um, like the, the, the boundaries of the, um, of the townlands. And then underneath the name of the townland, you'll see A dot R dot P. And these are um, the acres, 393 acres, the roods, three, and the perches, 13. So they are, of course, the uh, traditional sort of imperial units of measurement for areas and are based upon the, the surveys themselves, the field-based surveys. And of course, today we have this fantastic archive or legacy, really, for research, for researching these townlands, their names, the localities, their landscapes, their people, uh, but also thinking about the Ordnance Survey themselves. The maps themselves actually have a huge amount of information within them, which we can begin to use to explore how the maps were made, how the townlands were mapped. And what this relates to one of my, my own particular research interests, which is to try and connect a map, which is really the end of the process of making maps. The map is the final sort of product, if you like. I'm trying to relate maps to landscapes. Um, that, it, that means really looking at maps and thinking about how they were made in the field, how they were made through surveying practices, the use of theodolites, for example, and other instruments, scientific instruments, by the, in this case, the Ordnance Survey surveyors. So I'm trying to look behind the map in, in a kind of figurative sense to the landscape. And it's something that another um, researcher in this area, Matthew Edney, has uh, highlighted in actual quotation there saying that map historians have been happy to leave field work and surveying well enough alone. So my efforts here and the OS 200 project more generally is to try and correct that, uh, that, uh, that issue there. Underlying the Ordnance Survey six inch maps is quite a complex uh, geometry of, of uh, lines, which we see on that map there, which is a map showing us the uh, trigonometrical network. Now we're not gonna get really into the technicalities here too much, but to make the Ordnance Survey six inch maps accurate um, in terms of uh, their cartography, um, Thomas Colby oversaw the creation of a trigonometrical network. That's basically a series of triangles, as you can see on the map. And those triangles interconnect key points, the summits of mountains and hilltops around the island of Ireland, where the, the men, the Ordnance Survey surveyors, positioned their theodolite and made their observations. And it was on the basis of those observations that they were able to calculate distances. So they weren't literally measuring the ground from Sleeve Donard um, through to Divis. They were setting up their instruments on Sleeve Donard on the summit and using their theodolite to take measurements and observations to the neighbouring summits, including those in Britain and the Isle of Man. And on the basis of trigonometry making and the, the bearings, the angles that they were calculating, deducing the distances. So that's really an important sort of base, the basis of the Ordnance Survey uh, six inch uh, maps. The maps themselves contain some clues um, to us, uh, tell us a little bit about who was involved. And this is quite a peculiar uh, aspect of the six inch maps for Ireland. They, they, there are some examples of this in England as well, the Ordnance Survey six inch maps of England, but slightly later than the ones we're looking at here in Ireland. So this is actually from near Dan Patrick, and it shows on the margins of the map. This is this again underlines the point how that the map itself is not just the information about the landscape, but the marginal information as well around the edges. So this particular uh, six inch sheet tells us that it was surveyed by a certain Captain English and a Lieutenant Rimmington of Royal Engineers in 1834. And um, so they were the, the chaps doing the survey in the field. And then it was engraved in the direction of Lieutenant Larkham. And the rest of that passage says uh, at the headquarters of the Ordnance Survey in Dublin, where they set up at Mountjoy House in Phoenix Park, which is still actually the kind of symbolic HQ, if you like, of Ordnance Survey Island. So we have this information. The maps themselves record something of their 
their, their connection to the landscape, their connection to the field, if you like. Now, here's an extract from Thomas Colby's instructions, which I've just highlighted, because one of the things that it tells us is how the maps were made, being made in the field through the landscape itself and how the surveyors actually had quite cumbersome and in some cases quite fragile equipment. That, that great theodolite on the bottom right hand side there, now in the Science Museum in London, was a theodolite used for the trigonometrical survey from the summit stations like Divis. And in between those points, they used other theodolites, and they also used chains, like we see there in the top right. And those chains were important for making the measurements in the landscape and through the landscape, and therefore creating the maps as well. And if we think about, if we look at the map, this is again back at Benevena. Uh, if we look at the Ordnance Survey six inch map, we see actually those red lines are my lines, by the way. We actually see lots and lots of information relating to the levels, the, the heights of the landscape, because there are no contours on these first edition six inch maps. Instead, the uh, ups and downs of the land, the topography is indicated by these lines of um, spot heights, they're called. And uh, in the in the memoir that uh, Portlock wrote for Thomas Colby, he makes reference to these chaining lines, they're called. Um, and it says in that quotation, how we might observe the rise of a hill by following the course of a chain line noting the successive levels marked along it. So those are little heights. And those red lines there on the map, which I've added, in effect, enable us to see exactly where the surveyors traverse through the landscape, where the way they went from trigonometrical station to trigonometrical station with their chains, dragging those chains across the landscape, making their uh, measurements and observations in the field. And if we begin to overlay the Ordnance Survey 6 inch map with a modern aerial image as we can do with a prone historical map viewer we get some sense of the lie of the land and we begin to perhaps think a little bit about the complexities of undertaking that field survey work so those surveyors were you know highly trained in their uh, in their in their in their um in their measurement in their surveying in their craft if you like um and had to be accurate in in their survey work as well so across the townlands you can see the townland name there whether they were bogs, whether they were woods, where, whether it was arable land, where it was pastoral land, whether it was built up or not built up, those men were dragging their chains and, and they were given the inverted commas privilege uh, and authority to do so. So one of the things I've done with a, another project called Mapping Monuments um, up on the North Coast, uh, funded by National Lottery Heritage Funds, and we have a group of great um, volunteers involved with this project based up at Benevena, um, on the north coast there, we actually went out into the field and followed in the footsteps of the surveyors. That's what all those little, all of those little pegs are. And this is something that I worked with Rebecca Milligan uh, on and Grace McAllister as well as part of the project. And we went out into the field. So here we are following in the footsteps of the surveyors. And I don't know if you can just about see the ranging poles coming down off that hillside there, which we were all kind of gazing up at. That's one of those chaining lines. And it's that kind of field work, connecting landscape back to the map, thinking about the map and how it's produced and created through the field, which I think is really important for us to understand. So this was uh, an arduous and significant task undertaken by the surveyors. Let me just do a shout out for Mapping Monuments. We have the Heritage Angels Awards uh, coming up. We've been nominated, hooray, please vote for us, okay? Um, so check out the Heritage Angels Awards and, and you'll see that you can vote for mapping monuments. So um, that's looking at the field uh, and mapping through the field. What we're also looking at with Ordnance Survey 200 are the maps like the ones I've just shown you. Those maps contain a huge amount of information. And what we were able to do digitally, thanks to Zenobi here, especially Zenobi Garrett's work on the project, is to begin to visualize the geographies of the Ordnance Survey six inch maps. And the colorful map you see on the left hand side, as you can see from the key, gives us an indication of the progress of the six inch Ordnance Survey maps across Ireland from the north uh, in the purpley colors all the way down to the red colors down in the south. And what you can see from that map straight away is that it took them a long time to get going. So, you know, 1829, 1830, 1831, they're really only still in the north at that point. But by the time you get down to the um, to the red area, down to the south and southwest county, Kerry County, Cork, in one or two years, they're covering huge areas. 
And to me, that indicates actually they're really getting into the swing of things. They've got a system and it's working. And on the right hand side, there's a way, another way of visualizing that sort of same idea, really, is uh, this particular graph. And the names on the right hand side, the far right hand side of the surveyors that are named on the maps. And you can begin to see the productivity, if you like. We're all about productivity these days. We never hear anything else, do we, really, from the government about productivity. But we can see here the productivity of those surveyors um, as, that, as that curve goes up very steeply, rising up, up. These are the percentages of towns surveyed each year by the surveyors. As you can see, there's a massive amount of volume, and then it begins to tail off after about 1839. So we can do quite interesting things visualising using digital tools. So, okay, so what we're looking at here then is something similar in a sense. So we've got the left-hand side from 1829 to 1842, the survey dates. Uh, but then on the right-hand side, we've got the dates when the maps were engraved. So again, we can look at the geographies of this process of the making of the maps. That's really the point here. Putting those two, those two things together, the map on the right-hand side shows you the kind of the, the, the lag between doing the survey in the field and then the engraving work. So in some cases it was quite close, uh, like in green. Uh, then in other cases, as you see there, some areas of the country of Ireland as a whole, there is a, a lag between the survey work and the actual production of the map there. So there's the things like that we can begin to explore, again, through just visualizing the map margins. And one of the things that I've been particularly interested in looking at with my colleagues on this project is the surveyors themselves. And if you look at the map on the right hand side, those different colors represent different surveyors or groups of surveyors. And there's a geography to this, it's not random. It's not like the surveyors are scattered about all over the place. There are particular groups or groupings of surveyors working in particular parts of the island of Ireland at particular dates. And we can begin to visualize that and think about its relationship. Here's Tucker. You see, Tucker was working with other surveyors, but he also covered quite a large part of the south and east part of, of the island. And Tucker himself, we can begin to sort of drill down to some, some of the details here. We can map out his, uh, his, his sort of trajectory through, as, through surveying uh, Ireland through these six inch ordnance survey sheets. So we're looking here at his activities in the field, in the landscape from the maps where he was, uh, where he was named. So we can see he starts off in the north and this is actually quite a lot of work uh, further in the south um, and the east. There's a little quotation there as well about Tucker in the field assaulted by Father Maguire, the local Paris pre parish priest, clearly very embarrassed. Dr. Crawley, the Catholic Bishop of Down O'Connor, wrote to Colby, Thomas Colby, about this regrettable incident and promised disciplinary action. So we get these sort of little sort of vignettes, really, these sort of little clues and pointers about their activities. But also through the mapping, we can begin to see, again, the scale of the challenge of mapping these townlands, these 60,000 townlands. Another way of visualizing the activities of surveyors is to look at the townlands themselves. So this is for County Fermanagh. And you can begin to see there the different colours represent the number of surveyors being employed in and across the townlands for, for County Fermanagh. You'll see Lockhearn there uh, in the middle. Um, and so, you know, in some cases there are quite a big number of surveyors operating. There's four in the darker green colours, but in other cases there's just two. So again, there are interesting geographical patterns to this, patterns that we can begin to explore in a bit more detail and we're going to move now we're moving now towards the townlands and connecting the surveyors the map makers we end up with the final six inch ordnance survey map that's the product but we can begin to see here through these visualizations the way in which the ordnance survey surveyors themselves are operating in the landscape in the field and in these townlands and how there are particular geographies to these i think that's my bit finished so I'm going to stop sharing and then now I'm going to hand over to Francis. My screen, hopefully I'll make this as seamless as possible. Um, okay. So can somebody give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? You should, see if you should be seeing Father Ted. Yes, that's okay, Francis. All right, great. Thanks, Maria. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody for um, 
for coming along tonight. Um, and thanks to Keith for taking the first part of the session. I'm going to kind of move um, on to, a, a, I suppose, a related point from where Keith finished and in terms of the townlands um, and the level of the townlands. And one of the key aspects to the cr creation of these maps was um, the names that had to go on a map because obviously a, a map with a ton of boundaries that aren't identified aren't really isn't really any use to anybody. So um, there was a particular process um, in terms of the deciding which names would go on the map, how they would be spelt, what they would look like, and the different authorities that fed into those. Um, so my background is is in place names. That's what I'm I'm going to bring to to the story today. And the Father Ted um, reference should make sense to those of you here of a particular age that will remember Father Ted. Um, and take particular note of the place name there on the picture there, Quan Rickard. So in terms of our names then, um, the place names that we see in the landscape around us have um, their origins in a variety of different languages. So we have names of English origin. Um, English first came to Ireland with Anglo-Norman settlers in the 12th century. Um, we also know that these settlers spoke, 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 spoke both English and French. Um, and we can usually recognize those types of names by particular elements in them. So um, the place name component town or tune usually indicates um, uh, a place name coined by English settlers. We also have um, examples of Scots elements in our place names. Um, so Scots is spoken in Lowland Scotland, but it came to Ulster in um, great numbers in the early 17th century plantations. So we see a huge amount of um, our Scots place names in and around places that had Scottish settlement in the 17th century. So County Antrim and County Dal Donegal are places that we see Scots place names um, and elements like Burn and Bray give us an indication that those names were coined by, by the Scots. We have a small handful of names that have their origins in Old Norse and um, particularly in coastal regions. So names like Carlingford and um, Strangford have their names um, in, in Old Norse coined by the Vikings. Um, so as aside from the ones that we're going to focus on today, we have to kind of um, recognize the different languages that are in the place names. And sometimes we even have examples of names that kind of are a bit of a dolly mixture of, of elements from different languages. Um, bundled together in one name. So a lot of what I do in terms of the Northern Ireland Place Name Project work is I suppose putting apart those names and, and dusting them off and seeing what the stories are behind the different elements that have come together and the names that are still around us today. So in terms of the names on the map and those that we're particularly interested in this evening for townlands, um, the majority of townland names have their origins in the Irish language and this just um, is a is she reflecting of the fact that Irish was the language spoken here for, for a very long time. Irish was almost totally, Ar Ireland was almost totally Irish speaking until the 17th century. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. And this is reflected in the names that are around us today. Even those that don't look very Irish, they are of Irish origin, but some of them have, have come through a period of transition. Um, so if you see, um, the, if you're ever in the south, you'll see the white road signs. You'll have two versions of the name. You'll have in, in capital letters or in uppercase, you'll have the anglicized version of the name. And then in italics above that, you'll have the Irish language version of the name. But what's interesting that it, it's not always um, obvious, even to speakers of Irish themselves, the, the connection between the two forms. They're um, sometimes mutated or corrupted um, in the process of moving from one language to another. And this is something that the um, Ordnance Survey had to deal with at the time, 200 years ago, when they were creating the maps and deciding on the names for the maps. Um, in a time, I suppose, when Irish was in the decline, but still being very much spoken in lots of the localities that they were surveying 200 years ago. So in terms of uh, names going on a map, um, there, the process of deciding what names went on a map um, far predates the Ordnance Survey of 200 years ago. But um, for the most part, the names and the extensive lands were preserved mostly orally before the arrival of the Anglo-Normans in the 12th century. So it was the arrival of the Anglo-Normans who, who really started in earnest with documenting the names of lands um, in and around this time. So I suppose the, the question of what way they would be spelt wasn't really um, an issue before the time when they started to be recorded in documents. So a great number of Irish place names um, 
particularly those of an administrative nature, including our townlands, were first and only ever recorded in English sources um, and therefore anglicised or transliterated and recorded according to the conventions of English at the time, um, sometimes obscured beyond recognition. So at the time then of the Ordnance Survey 200 years ago, the personnel of the Ordnance Survey, they encountered difficulties with the orthography documentation and deciding on the standard forms of the names. If we think of the situation here very much, um, we had a situation where we had um, personnel who were monolingual English speakers, perhaps encountering monolingual Irish speakers and, and trying to document the names of the map of the places to go on the maps with um, kind of no mutual language between them. The engineers were unfamiliar with the Irish language um, and even in places where English was the language of the being spoken at the time, the place name still existed orally in the Irish language and very much so not written down. So in terms of the names to go on the map, to avoid confusion or legal ambiguity, it was thought necessary to, to anglicize the names so to make them more appropriate for the, the English tongue, um, which we saw previously, and then to standardize the spellings of their different elements. And I'm gonna talk a bit about that in, in a couple of slides time. So to reach the original form of a name or to at least get as near to it as possible, they couldn't do it themselves. And they had to, to find some, bring someone in who had familiarity with uh, the Irish language, familiarity with the names, um, and to go out and gather those names so that the forms that were decided upon for the map were um, close uh, and accurate to the um, to the original name, um, but also consistent so that the same form of a particular name or element would be across the maps for the whole of the, of the island. So <clears throat> at this time, the Ordnance Survey enlisted um, John O'Donovan, who Keith has already mentioned. Professor John O'Donovan was also the first professor of Celtic at Queen's. Um, and he was already an established expert in, in Irish language uh, documents and literature. He was appointed to suggest the standard forms and to carry out field work. So he was really sent out into the field to talk to um, people in the localities to and to record their names, the way they were spelled, the way they were pronounced. And John O'Donovan um, gathered what we now call the Ordnance Survey name books. So he literally traveled townland by townland, parish by parish, writing down alphabetical lists of the place names that were then to become standardized for the um, inclusion and the engraving on the first edition of the six inch maps. So the standardization became a really core part of this work um, and recurring elements that may have been pronounced quite differently in different parts of the country were to be written down in the same um, English form. So this is a quote here. It says that recurring elements needed to be standardized even in defiance of local usage. So on the dairy maps, Ballynock became Ballynock with a silent K and Drummard became Drummard. So, so common names like Drum and Bally and Liss all had to have the same English form for the maps. So this is what the name books look like. The picture on the left hand side, and um, we see three columns. There is a received name. So that was the the name of the townland and then the columns that went alongside that we had an orth orthography name so um different ways that the name may have been spelt in the localities and then the authorities to so the people that well the people and the documents that john o'donovan collected these names from um and then they would go away take these name books away and um decide then on, on the form that was to go on the map so we have the handwritten uh, Ordnance Survey name books for most of the counties. Um, and then we also have, um, on the right hand side, we see uh, this is a, a type transcription by an individual called Michael Flanagan, um, who undertook a big project um, in the 1900s to, to type up the Ordnance Survey name book. So in, ter in terms of the work for Ordnance, the OS200 project, we relied on both the handwritten name books and the um, the tr the transcriptions that we could then digitize for inclusion on our um in our database, but I suppose there's another layer then of translation, another layer of of transmission of names from one to another, even from the handwritten ones and to the tra transcribed ones. So we have to kind of consider that when we're thinking of these as as original sources. 
So what kind of things um, were documented then by, by John O'Donovan? So not only did he um, record the names for the maps, he also wrote letters um, back and forward to the Ordnance Survey headquarters in Phoenix Park. Um, and these letters make a really interesting reading. Um, so this is an example of um, a let, an excerpt from a letter from John O'Donovan written from Donegal. He says, I hope the names will not be the names books will not be delayed for the weather is most distressing here. I am weary to death's door with the noise and interruptions of drunken fishermen in the head inn of Dunlow. It is a head inn or what I would call a noisy public house. As bad as it is, I was glad to get my head into it last Saturday night. So thinking about the stories of the Ordnance Survey, and Keith mentioned earlier about stories of the experiences of the Ordnance Survey personnel in the field, there's a real insight in these sources into, into what they encountered as they were going through the process of creating these resources. And I think in the terms of the, the project, um, the OS200 project, putting these resources together really builds for a much richer story. Um, the second um, picture on the on the screen here is um, sometimes he took he took notes um, and um, just made a suggestion what he thinks it is. So this is um, Yellen Ginkin, so Loch Ilgankyon, which we now know is the Lake of the Headless Man. Um, but John Donovan has commented on it. It seems Chinese. So again, he's have he's putting his opinion and giving commentary on the names that he's coming across as he travels across the island. So in terms of standardization, um, this is an example from County Fermanagh. Um, and the element clune, which means meadow or pasture land, is typically anglicized clon in place names. So if you see clon um, on the bottom left here, we see a Thailand called clon, clune, clune in Kerry. Um, so it can be anglicized clune or clon, but we see both in County Kerry the L and in County Donegal in the two small maps on the bottom left, they're both anglicized the same way. So this is an example of the same anglicized form emerging for the map, despite the fact that they probably would have been pronounced very differently in, from one end of the country to the other. And the same element is referenced by O'Donovan when he's writing from Fermanagh from Clonus. He says, I've changed some townlands beginning with Clin to Clon. So in the localities, they may have been written down Clin to reflect local pronunciation. Um, but he says, I'm convinced this is a corruption of the word Clune, but the country people always call it Clin. So again, these efforts to standardize and make sure that whenever a place name element was anglicized, it was anglicized the same way, no matter where it landed um, in, in the country. So this anglicization process kind of, um, in a way can make it easier for us in, our, in terms of our process of restoration, because we have predicted or um, a sense of the patterns in which um, place name elements emerge in their anglicized form. So um, common place name components like bally, kill, drum, knock, gliss, we tend to have a good idea what the original Irish language element was in those types of names because of the standardization, because they were kind of set on this path by, by O'Donovan and his contemporaries. So this is where I'm going to put in back father, to Father Ted. We also see these um, elements in fictional place names, so names like Bally Angel and Clon Rickert and Inishirin. Um, they, they don't exist, but um, people tend to be creative and then they draw on these common anglicized components in, in place names. So what's lost then within the process of anglicization and standardization? Well, the fact that um, lots of these elements are kind of grouped into particular forms uh, means we sometimes lose the complexity or the subtleties in the, in the original Irish language forms. So we have at least 19 townlands called Ballymoney across Ireland. But if you look at the examples there on the right hand side of the screen, Ballymoney can have one of several different um, origins. So it can have um, a surname, it can refer to bogs and thickets. Um, and if we have just the bare anglicized form alone, that kind of information is lost. Um, so, so there's advantages and disadvantages to the process that um, went into the names. Um, this is a, a short graphic that I'm not gonna spend much time on, but I'm, it's, I suppose, summing up the different um, influences on the names um, in, that, in the way they were brought from one, from one language to the other. So they start out in Irish, 
but they move from Irish to English, um, a language that has a different spelling system, different alphabets, different speakers, different words and different pronunciations. And then obviously the standardization means that they're obscured sometimes beyond recognition. So with something like Dunanal becomes Donegal. But another consequence of this anglicization is that um, the names are recorded according to the conventions of contemporary English at the time. So if you have names that are being recorded by um, English speakers, they'll hear a sequence of signs and they'll write it down or they'll approximate it to something that they will know in their own lexicon and their own language. So we have a number of false friends in our namescape. So these are, I suppose, a couple of tall tales that are in our townlands or, or false friends that we like to call them. So names like Desert Martin, Money Moore and Drum Goose might look like they um, contain English elements, but there's no desert in Desert Martin. There's certainly not a pot of money in Money Moore and there are um, no particular references to Drum or Goose and Drum Goose. This is just um, a process of approximation or, or spelling something the way that is familiar to an English speaker. Um, and you'll see the origins of these are, are actually quite different in the Irish form. So when we see money, um, it usually means mwinya, um, a thicket. Um, drum has something to do with the drum. A drum is a ridge or the word for your back, a metaphorical use of your back. So we see these kind of false friends in the linguistic landscape around us that don't actually refer to what it looks like. Another one um, is Ballina Mallard. And we sometimes see these types of misinterpretations of anglicized forms of place names gaining currency. Um, so Ballina Mallard, Ballina Mallard United Football Club um, they have a, a mallard on their badge, but actually the original name of Ballina Mallard has nothing to do with a duck. Um, and this leads me on to the, the, the final part of today's talk is that the tales from the townlands, and I suppose the townland names, while they're being anglicised and obscured, the stories are sometimes lost, but how can we draw upon the sources of the Ordnance Survey that we're digitising for OS 200 to... Um, to tell us the real story behind the names. And I'm going to start again with Ballina Mallard. So it's not the townland of the duck or the townland of the mallard. Um, it's actually Ballina Mallard comes from Bell Aham the Malloch, the Ford mouth of the curses. And we see on the right hand side there, this is the letter from John O'Donovan writing from Fermanagh in 1834. He says, uh, the name Ballina Mallard has puzzled me. The country people call it Ballina Mallard in Irish Bell Aham the Malloch the mouth of the Ford of Curses. Um, and then he talks about um, analogies with other Bali place names or Bell place names. Um, and then there's lots of information there about um, the kind of folk etymologies behind it. Um, and the, the story of Ballina Mallard is to do with a, a legend of a, a curse that St. Colin Kill placed on the roosters uh, in the sixth century. So I suppose, the names on the map only tell us so much, but by connecting the names on the map with the other sources, we can reveal the wider tales from the townlands. Um, and that's what we're planning to do with, with this project. So that was Bell and Mallard. Um, another example of a, a tale from the townland is uh, Lisburn and the related fate for Lisnagarvey. So the earthen ring fort, um, which was in the area, which we now know as Fort Hill and Lisburn, can actually be seen on the earliest OS first edition map from um, 1832. So you'll see the excerpt here. We have the townland of Lisnagarvey and the fort in the middle of it. Then if you go to the Ordnance Survey Memoirs, it refers to the same townland. We know that the um, adjoining the fort, there was an eminent bowling green and the fort itself was also a theatre for various amusements such as card play and dice play. So by connecting the different um, Outputs of the Ordnance Survey from 200 years ago, we can really build a fuller picture of the, of the stories and the stories of the places um, that were covered, the, the townlands themselves. Another one of my favourites is Clohagadi in County Fermanagh. Um, this is a townland that has its origins in Clohagadi, the, th the thief stone. Um, so the very bottom of the screen here, we have the little box. We see an excerpt from John O'Donovan's name book. So he says, Clohadagadi, the thief stone. The stone is about the height of a man, like a sugar loaf, a man stealing a sheep was found hanged. And then there's other kind of local information about the different forms. So we spe see it spelled Clohagadi with a U, um, Clohagadi with, without a U, um, and then some local information. Um, a thief was hanged, a clock stone, gaddy is a word for thief. Um, popular saying, the sheep hung stones. So even in the name books that were 
um, plan to be lists of, of names, of authoritative names, um, sometimes have this information um, and that's in addition to what was intended to be gathered. Um, and then in the letter that accompanies the townland of Kohagadi, um, John O'Donovan says, in Galoon you will find a townland called Kohagadi, meaning the thief stone. The name is derived from a very remarkable stone in the townland, uh, about the height of a man and terminating like a sugar loaf. The name is accounted for by a story about a thief who was stealing a sheep. He had the sheep tied on his back by a rope around his breast. And when he was passing by the stone, he leaned his burden against it. But the sheep slipped over the stone. The rope slipped up to the thief's neck and actually hanged him. So he met a grisly end after stealing the, the, the sheep. But again, connecting the Ordnance Survey name books with the Ordnance Survey letters and then with the with the maps, we can build a fuller picture of the, the stories behind the townlands. And there's an image of the stone. It's still there. That's from the Northern Ireland Sites and Monuments record um, that we can also use to to connect to our townlands. And I, I suppose a wider aim of what we want to do is when we have our database ready, so it's connecting to other data sets and drawing in on information that other um, individuals have gathered to gain enhance the, the stories of the townlands and the places. One more tale from the townland, because I can, I can see we're running out of time, um, is from the townland of Forraf in County Antrim, um, just in Red Bay outside Waterford on the Antrim coast. Um, and in the Ordnance Survey Memoirs, we see the story of Nanny's Cave. And the OS Memoir for County Antrim tells us it was inhabited for 20 years by an old woman who in defiance of the excise man has sold illicit whiskey. So uh, she supports herself by her own industry, knitting and spinning with a small profit derived from the sale of a drop of the native. So again, connecting the maps with the different um, sources, the Ordnance Survey sources, we can build a fuller picture of the stories of, of the country 200 years ago. So that kind of brings us to the, the point where we are now and that we're almost at the position where we can um, start to share this information and share the, the digitized data that we've been working on for the last couple of years. So much like I've done in the last couple of slides, um, the database, the publicly searchable database that we're going to be providing really connects the sources together. So the Ordnance Survey letters that documented surveyors' experiences and their impressions of the local people. The memoirs that documented landscape buildings, um, local information and these hand-drawn sketches. The name books and then the maps. Um, by putting these all together, we really hope to facilitate further exploration of, of Ireland as it was 200 years ago. So as Keith said, we're um, planning to release and launch the database at our conference in Dublin in 2024, just on the on the bicentenary of the Ireland survey starting out in Ireland. Um, our website is irelandmap.ie, so there'll be lots of information on that. Um, for details for um, whenever it's launched. Um, and then that's really us. Keep in touch um, and we're happy to take some questions. I know we ran a bit over time, but um, I, I'm happy to stay around for a wee while and answer anybody's questions in the, in the chat or if anybody wants to turn their camera on. Um, thanks again for your time. Thanks to Keith for, for collaborating with me on this and thanks to Libraries NI for inviting us to, to come and tell you about our project this evening.